exciting. We got to our last presentation of the day, um, wrapping up the academic track at the uh, 2022 state of the map is and still and least still sorry um which is from from <laughs> i managed to forget uh the graduate institute of international and development studies in geneva switzerland and she's going to present some anthropological work on open street map which i think is the first one since 2010 uh and i would been expecting to see something like that for a while now so looking forward <laughs> cool um thank you so much um hello everyone i'll set my timer to make sure if i stay on time um as i said before i'm an anthropologist and so i was wondering if there are other anthropologists in the space uh, uh presenting their work and perspectives on the world of open street Pop. and i'm all about getting uh, academic work, especially anthropology, out of the academy and the ivory tower into the world. Um, but I also have this very long and in many ways cumbersome title of Mapping Crises, Communities, and Capitalism on OpenStreetMap, um, Situating Humanitarian Mapping in the Open Source Mapping Supply Chain. That's a lot for a Sunday afternoon here in Florence um, or wherever you're calling from in the world. And what I'll be presenting is kind of the result of a year and a half of um, ethnographic work, which really translated into just talking to mappers in real time and trying to learn from their experiences. And then from that, trying to draw and extrapolating maybe larger, larger um, understandings about our social world. I will flag that I did give a previous version of this talk um, at the Hot Summit last year in November. And I only flag it just because there were different things that I empathized, emphasized, and I think they kind of fit together in a way. Um, but first, and the most obvious question is probably, what's an anthropologist doing at State of the Map in the first place? Anthropologists, you know, we say we study things like culture, and we're very much implicated in the colonial project, in you know the history of exploration and empire. Um, but you know, we're still around. And in fact, in many ways, the most interesting work is no longer being done in those spaces, but in the wider world around us. Um, and what we aim to do is try to connect um, individual experiences to wider processes, um, really just starting with like the rituals of our social interactions, uh, what connects us to each other, what gives us a sense of belonging, and then extrapolate from there. Um, there have been anthropologists who have studied social movements, who have studied hackers, been at the UN, uh, open source software developers, uh, humanitarians, and even an ethnographer embedded within the Mars Rover project, which is pretty cool. Um, but the question here is really that I was asking um, was, can we learn about data-driven communities with analog methods? And I think the answer is really strongly yes. Um, just another note, uh, before OSM, a lot of what I'd focused on was on extractive economies. Um, and that meant looking at, yes, how coltan goes from the mines of Katanga into the cell phones that you have in front of you. But the way that I did that was looking at the bureaucratic processes surrounding that. So hanging out with a lot of CSR paperwork and in the halls of the United Nations. Again, asking questions like, who are the people actually involved um, in this very abstract process? And what are those processes exactly? And how is power distributed throughout that system? The research methods uh, that I've used, um, ethnography is kind of a wibbly wobbly thing, but it prim primarily relied on interviews with people, um, sitting with them for long periods of time, lots of participant observation in different events. And I know none of this probably has any, um, any hold on people who have really been in the open street map community for years and years and years, and probably these numbers go up into the hundreds, right? Um, but I will say that I did sit with a lot of archival documentation of the OpenStreetMap community, which meant, I think, looking at over maybe 100 state of the map and hot summit talks over the course of the past 10 years, um, reading a lot of Twitter threads and flame wars on, uh, on the OpenStreetMap uh, mailing list serves, reading OSM diaries, listening to podcasts, really trying to understand, you know, how do mappers communicate with each other? Because in many ways, I needed to read the documentation for, before I even spoke to mappers themselves. And I really want to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who's spoken to me. Um, and uh, it really was an honor to be able to learn more about how you uh, got into the big wide world of open street mapping. <laughs> 
So on a small scale, the questions were, you know, what, who makes OpenStream out? Why did they contribute? How is power distributed in this ecosystem? But also how is humanitarian mapping affected or being affected by other really big questions about labor, about humanitarianism, about technology, and maybe, and very aggressively, what can OpenStream map tell us about the wider social world? So going into the, into the deep stuff here, beginning with trying to unpack why am I talking about things like crises and communities and capitalism? Crises in many ways emerged as this means of trying to understand the values behind people mapped. Um, community was also a proxy for labor and capitalism was of course a proxy for the market forces that dictate all our lives. So entering the, the field of OpenStreetMap really started very fittingly with a humanitarian mapathon at the Humanitarian Congress back in 2020. But the more videos that I watched um, throughout the hot summits and state of the map, the more that I realized that crisis mapping, which was the way that I was introduced to the world of um, OpenStreetMap, was really not a term that was used within this space at all. And in many ways with um, the more present and active OpenStreetMappers, it was contested, it was debated, it was always ongoing. And so really the question that came out of this, and really this talk is just a series of questions with perhaps no answers, um, is of course, what constitutes a crisis in the first place? Um, we have the crises that are visible to all of us um, that we talk about as crises, like our financial crises, our supply chain crises, the housing crisis, but what are the crises that we normalize? What are the ones that aren't thought of as crises that are endemic to our societies um, and therefore how does that dictate the type of maps that we make? Um, but of course, this is something that's been talked about and debated and uh, brought to the forefront many different times before by folks like uh, David Garcia. Um, and then the more I learned about OpenStreetMap through all of this different documentation was really asking, is OpenStreetMap itself a kind of community in crisis? Looking from the outside, there are many different debates going on all the time about so many different parts of the project and they seem to fall under a kind of um, under a dividing line, not one that was harsh, but rather that seemed to group these debates in different directions. On one hand, you had conversations about who is in the community, what does it consist of, what does it mean, who is represented in that community, um, what does the sustainability of the project look like. But then on the other hand, you had um, you know, the ever present debate about what does a tagging schema look like in these communities of communities? Um, what are questions of data quality and what does that mean for this giant database? Um, what editors are being made, software libraries, and the many, many, many different applications of OpenStreetMap as a, um, as a database. And so really, on one hand, crisis was something that was always being negotiated. It was an ongoing debate and it was flexible, but it was also strategic that affected the kinds of crisis maps that were made. Um, but also crises was kind of constitutive of the OpenStreetMap community in the first place. The rituals of places like State of the Map and the Hot Summit were a place where these debates happen real time and also in many ways reinforced OpenStreetMap as a community itself. Um, but an important question that emerged out of this and of conversations with mappers was that in this divide between community-based and technical-based questions, how is that affecting communities that are being developed and how will that affect how communities develop going forward? Secondly, as I began to, to speak to people in the, um, to folks in the OpenStreetMap universe, I also began to kind of trace out where along what began to turn into a series of processes um, began to map out what, what part of OpenStreetMap were they actually talking about when they said, I contribute to OSM? Because for me, at the beginning, I was just thinking that I was contributing to this database. But actually, of course, as you all are far more familiar with than I am, um, that's not it, right? That's not, if anything, that's just the beginning. Um, but they, in many ways, seem to kind of go along a couple of different lines with certain people more involved in the building of infrastructure surrounding the project. Um, Open, adding data to the to OpenStreetMap being only a single part of it, checking the accuracy of that data and its eventual applications being embedded in a much larger process, kind of organically becoming, you know, an upstream side of OpenStreetMap as well as a downstream one. Again, this language is used already in, in the software world. 
And the more mappers that I spoke to, similarly, they were kind of distributed across this almost artificial schema, right? Um, with some kind of gravitating towards the beginning and open infrastructure um, side of the project with others much more focused on its applications in the wider world and the uses of that data. But with this in mind, when I asked people what power looked like in the OpenStreetMap universe, they almost always said that it was tied to the number of change sets that you made within the database. So despite all of these different types of roles and different ways in which people were part of OpenStreetMap, it always ultimately went back to the number of changes that you've made to the map. So of course, mapping a community, mapping really many uh, as Everyone um, really emphasizes and it's so important, this community of communities is really mapping a very, very distributed process. Um, but community engagement in that process was kind of split alongside one side. If you said it's just a map, you're usually a one time or a beginner mapper. But if you said it's not just a map, it's a database, you're usually more associated with an upstream role. And then if you talked about OpenStreetMap being a part of a much wider industry and set of processes, you would talk about its downstream, um, you, were, you were much more likely to be associated with its downstream uh, effects. And of course, community source is not the same thing as being a crowdsource project in the sense that OpenStreetMap really builds upon a lot of ongoing work that talks about the importance of recursive publics, meaning publics that are not so much just concerned with um, being out there in the world, but also reinforcing themselves as a community and um, creating their own community health as well. And those recursive publics are actually what sustain a project, not just its uses in the wider world. And finally, and probably the most difficult and aggressive thing to bring to this talk this afternoon, talking about capitalism. <laughs> so really want it with these kind of notions of crisis and community in mind, um, I really want to bring it back to a really important fact, right? Which is that OSM data is a really, really valuable commodity. Um, this report from Accenture back in 2020 valued uh, OSM data at 1.67 billion, which is a mind boggling number. Um, and it's not something that we fully talk through the implications of, right? Um, especially in our interpersonal relationships with each other. Of course, these fears of corporate creep have manifested themselves in the community many times over. And many conversations that I had with folks would often cite an article written by Joe Morrison about OpenStreetMap being a massive data set waiting to happen. Or they'd fear the effect of corporate editors and corporate mapping within the project. Or on the other hand, just say, you know, honestly, I'm a software developer. Like, I'm not in the C-suite. What is my role within this project? I, why am I facing um, this kind of critique from the community when in fact so many of these people are actually my friends. And so really going back to this um, schema that we've developed here is really asking, okay, if we were to ask, you know, truthfully and honestly, where do companies sit? And this is something really, uh, I think Richard talked through uh, at the beginning of open uh, state of the map is that companies are really involved in every part of this upstream and downstream process. And again, I don't think that's a surprise to anyone here. Um, what is a surprise and what we don't necessarily understand is how those individual experiences are tied to these wider processes. And these fears, they're well documented in many other spaces, right? Things like corporate creep. Um, and again, bringing back to, you know, what does power look like within the OpenStreetMap community? I would argue that maybe it's perhaps not just change sets, but something else. Perhaps in a way, if you're integrated into many other parts of OpenStreetMap and the OpenStreetMap supply chain, maybe that's actually what power looks like within OSM. But of course, um, it's always more complicated than that. Um, companies, corporations, anyone really giving money into this open source community you know, is a part of maintaining its infrastructure, supporting editors, so many people told me too how important external funding was, was in localization efforts and diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, codes of conduct themselves actually stem from, uh, from uh, corporate, uh, corporate models of the past 50 years that have attempted to create shared understandings of public behavior um, across difference. And it's, again, it's really important to understand where are these processes coming from? What are they tied to? And what do they actually mean for a, a community like OpenStreetMap? 
um, because they are extremely, extremely important. And drawing this to you know, much larger studies and many other people that have spent much longer studying these ideas is that it really plays into um, and also emphasizes a lot of work that has already been done about this collision between the value-driven world of not only humanitarian work and the need to do good and the need to help people, um, but also the value-driven work of the free and open source software movement, which comes with its own sets of ideals and its own ideas of how to make the world a better place. And this collides in very real time with the market-driven, profit-driven sphere of corporate interests. And uh, there's a really wonderful piece uh, by Scott Smith that talks about how humanitarian technology specifically is kind of a testing ground for what this collision looks like in real time. And OpenStreetMap, and specifically humanitarian mapping, is actually even more so a, of a test of this in real time. You know, what happens when our values collide with the market? Gosh, okay, I'm gonna really gonna zoom through. So, um, again, gonna plug here uh, a really long-term philosophy that's been held for ages and ages and ages is the notion of do well by doing good. Again, plays into you know, neoliberal economics, laissez-faire economics, um, again, well-documented. And so some questions to ask on the micro scale and in the short term. Yes, we've talked about communities. We've talked about uh, the rapid expansion of the humanitarian mapping project, the rapid expansion and influx of one-time mappers, um, and sometimes often the low quality edits of the synthesize, um, also the growth of AI assisted mapping. But let's also tie it to meso and macro scale questions. Like on the meso scale, yes, are we trying to create a map that can compete with Google? What does that mean? Um, trained feature detection algorithms with diverse data sets. And also, you know, this debate between is it just a map, but also acknowledge that it's a very valuable commodity and the responsibility that comes with that. Um, and on the macro, macro scale and in the long term, we have shifting landscapes of digital work where people are precarious all around the world, um, where wages are suppressed, where right now in the UK over the past couple of days, there have been strikes going on to protest low wages. And we have to acknowledge that we're a part of that larger system, right? Um, and also the, the growth of automation, the growth of ge the geospatial and humanitarian industries, they're of course very tied to militaries as well. These are really big questions and you know, OSM is very, very much intertwined with them. Um, and this was something that I'd written about in the thesis from a historical perspective, but we'll get to it here. So uh, kind of another question that I wanted to bring to this space was, uh, I've, I've seen in many state of the map talks and also in the hot summit talks, asking what it meant to have OSM be a kind of pluriverse, meaning a place that could contain difference. But oftentimes those conversations, both on a one-on-one -on -one way with mappers and with um, folks in these um, public spaces, often seem to sidestep or didn't really talk about the economic element. Um, and does that also mean when we talk about a pluriverse for open street map in the sense of containing peoples, does that also mean that we're going to replicate the same economic processes that are wreaking havoc in our societies worldwide? So, I'm gonna zoom through. I got two minutes to talk about supply chains. So, in conclusion, yes, I hope I've illustrated to you all a little bit that OpenStreetMap is like a supply chain. Um, it's precarious, as we've seen over the past couple of years um, with our physical supply chains, but also within the community that builds OpenStreetMap or the community of communities that build OpenStreetMap. Full of uncertainty, somehow still functioning, totally mazed by this community. Um, but I will say it also ties to you know, this whole way of understanding supply chain capitalism as something that constitutes the modern world, meaning more than anything else, it is actually the supply chain, the movement and logistics of, of goods and services, and in many ways, mobilizing different people and complicated systems where never, not everyone knows and can keep track of the entire system. Um, it's actually not so dissimilar from the difficulty of keeping track of who in the world is using OpenStreetMap data, what is it being used for, how do we contribute to it, and all these things. And I think that supply chains are a really good schema for trying to unpack this more so. And an obvious question being, if OSM is a supply chain, what are its breakpoints? Um, and we saw a great example of that when the Evergreen really stopped um, global trade at the Suez Canal. A couple of provocations or 
uh, things to ask. For example, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to OSM, uh, is a breakpoint actually the source of satellite imagery? Um, when it comes to adding data to OSM, is a breakpoint the maintenance of our editors? Um, is it supporting the folks and the systems that uh, check edits? Um, but is also, you know, what is uh, 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 compliance for licensing is always an ongoing issue, of course. Um, again, asking specifically for humanitarian mapping, what role does it play within this system? And where what where does it have knowledge, where does it not? Um, where do individual mappers have knowledge? Where do leader mappers have knowledge, where do they not? Same thing we can ask about corporate mapping. And I think the last thing that I want, would want to leave you all with is the question that if OSM is like a supply chain, who should be supported within it? Um, supply chains are known for being notoriously precarious places where that are the only visible when they break. And we've seen that over the course of the past couple of years of uh, the COVID-19 induced supply chain breakdowns. And so is a real question with the ongoing growth of the project and with the many people I've spoken to who care so much about it, including myself very much so, um, what will happen if it breaks or will it break? Um, who is invisible and invisible in this process? And what kind of map is this, you know, very large reaching um, supply chain of maps enabling? And ultimately, what kind of world does it enable in turn? Is that a pluriverse or is that something else? And I think that's it. Yeah, I think uh, judging by the applause, I think people like the, the approach. Uh -huh. And I already see some point fingers pointing up. So uh, I'll start with you. I start with the room. Uh, not a question, just a comment. I've been attending state, state of the map conferences since 2008. I've been boring people all the time that what we need is an anthropologist in residence. You have exceeded my wildest expectations. Uh, you have understood the community and you've placed it in a context in a remarkable way. So congratulations on your performance. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. A speaker's dream. I think uh, this kind of comment. Uh, any more questions from the room? Oh, up there. You're gonna make me walk all the. <laughs> oh, we need. You need to speak to the people in the in home as well. So it seemed to me from the research that maybe there's a differentiation of identity in the individuals that you're speaking to in their involvement in OSM. So I'm not, you're not in your head, so it seems like you'd agree. Did you see in your conversations that it seemed like those you were speaking to recognize the different identities within the OSM community so that they have a different identity than maybe something else there, someone else that they're communicating with, that they're mapping with? This is a bit of a thank you so much uh, and thank you also so much. Uh, it's. I'm going to give a little bit of a cop out answer and say that it depends <laughs> in the sense that um, the, the one thing that really struck me about watching state of the map uh, conference uh, videos and also the hot summit is how reflexive the community is inherently. Um, and so people are constantly made aware if they are not already aware of how different their perspectives and their use and way of thinking about the map is different from another person's. Um, and that is maybe only because they're in spaces like this where they can encounter difference in real time. So I'd say maybe everyone here is probably aware. Um, the question is whether or not extends online is a different one. Uh, because of course there's the telegram groups, uh, there's Slack channels, there's IRC, there's so many different places in which mappers interact. And I would say that these spaces are where people are most aware of that difference um, and are part of conversations about how to connect across difference. Okay, thanks. I'll move to uh, the venue list questions. Uh, are mappers comparable to supply chain workers? The former do it 50% because they need the data and 50% because they like it. The latter do it 100% to survive. <laughs> Was there a question in that? Are metrics comparable to supply chain workers? Ah, yes, definitely. Um, I think, if anything, that was what the core of this project eventually became, was about how um, 
let's say in a, in a typical supply chain, there are a series of processes that it goes through all across the world, right? There are people in every single part of that process that aren't visible to you and me because we're buying that phone that has Coltan that went through, we see in the news and see that it's made with slave labor and we don't know what that looks like. And, but at the same time, we know that somehow it got from point A to point B. And the whole point of a supply chain's approach is in many ways to try and actually trace in real time all the people that it interacts with, and it could be people you don't expect. And so similarly with OpenStreetMap data, so much of this conversation and conversations had with folks was about in real time trying to trace what in the world is going on before I interacted with OSM on my hiking app. And that actually meant talking to people who, you know, were not really visible to the public. Um, and because of that, and because of the effort and the time that they put into it, um, it feels like a really big responsibility for outsiders to be able to understand and fully kind of try to comprehend the labor of what that looks like. Um, because that means that maybe, and this is a big dream, uh, that the more aware we are of the labor behind an incredible project like OpenStreetMap, the more it can actually be embedded in a real way in, our, um, in anything that uses maps. I think a big problem is public perception of how complicated this process actually is. And so, yeah, hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> that was, uh, uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, but we have to stop, to stop. but uh, Anneli is still here. <laughs> so you can, you can bug her with all your questions. I know I have <laughs> a few. Um, yeah, so with that, we're finished up the conference, the, the conference, the academic track. Uh, so first of all, thanks to all speakers and attendees and for your questions.